yeah, I'm uh, really glad to be presenting here. I always, I get, I've attended this uh, meeting a couple of times now, or this is the second time. Um, and yeah, I always find it a really interesting way to, to meet and mingle with people that use climate data for really applied and important reasons. So I really enjoy being here. Um, I'm just gonna give an overview um, of basically how to get at weather data uh, from British Columbia based on the tools and the information that I uh, have at hand um, that people may or may not know about. Um, I didn't really tackle this in terms of pest research per se. Um, pests are not my, my forte, so I don't know exactly what people would be looking for. Um, so it's just kind of a broad brush look at um, how to get at data that people hopefully will find useful. Um, and I'm assuming that there's a wide level of expertise here. Um, you know, I have pest research in the title, um, but so to me, research implies um, pretty detailed uh, digging into data sets. But I know there's also a lot of practitioners and people that you know that have other things to do with their time that's more important than learning how to program. So I'll try to tackle this from in ways that allow both people to, or both groups to get the data that they need. So yeah, as Sam mentioned, I'm, I'm a climate analysis and monitoring lead at the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. Um, in case you don't know about us, we're, uh, we've got three overall themes. Um, so climate analysis and monitoring, that's me, um, mainly looking at past climate and just recent weather and climate anomalies. Um, and then our second theme is regional climate impacts. Uh, Trevor Murdoch formerly led that theme, but he has been seconded off to ECCC. And so now um, pretty soon, uh, Charles Curry is gonna be taking his spot. Uh, that theme is dedicated towards looking at how climate change is gonna impact uh, people on a regional and smaller scale. And then we have the hydrologic impacts theme uh, who looks at water and water resources in the province, uh, namely through modeling uh, very large watersheds like the Fraser and uh, Skeena and the Stikin and um, Thompson, et cetera, all the, all the big ones. And then sitting underneath the, the three themes, we have a whole bunch of postdoctoral and graduate researchers. And then underlying all of that, we have pretty strong computational support to help us do what we do. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what we offer here at PKIC, but um, PKIC isn't the only game in town. Um, we do distribute data, um, but Environment and Climate Change Canada also distributes data. Um, Farm West, uh, through Stephanie Tam and her group, um, distributes data and some data products. Um, so there's, there's a few players here to talk about. Uh, so yeah, so we mostly focus on recent and historical weather records in BC. Um, the stuff I'm going to show you now is just going to be data for BC, but we also hold records um, from, so station observational records from Yukon Northwest Territories in Alberta. Um, you know, that data is available if, if you ask nicely for it. Um, and then we create value added products. Um, so quality controlled homogenized data sets, um, monthly seasonal annual weather analysis, uh, look at trends, uh, climate indicators, and just de depicting the long-term climatology of BC. So the, the kind of average weather that we've experienced in the past. A lot of uh, what we do at PKIC with this data is made possible by the climate related monitoring program. Um, it's headed up by the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, um, but it encompasses all of the ministries that gather weather data um, for their various operations, as well as BC Hydro and Rio Tinto. And now, um, over the past year or two, the CRD and Metrovan, and, and we're looking at adding more partners. Uh, the purpose of the program um, is to 
basically bring together the expertise in weather monitoring uh, in the province uh, to help streamline networks uh, and also to share um, you know, technological insights. And finally, um, and most importantly for everybody here is to, to put that data into a large data set and then deliver it out um, to the public. Uh, this started in 2010 and has been renewed in 2018 and we're currently slated to keep going through um, 2026 and hopefully a lot longer than that. Um, so just some questions from a previous webinar that I gave um, that some people were interested in. And uh, so access and location of weather stations. Um, so you know, which ones are growers using is one, a question I can't answer, but we can definitely tell you where they are. Um, whether they're in field or on farm, that's a, that's a tougher question. Um, for the power user, we offer data services. Uh, so people that are interested in that, I'll try to give you some insight on how to, how to do that. Uh, download the data using R. Um, and then also how to download and use climate data and, and geographical information systems. So these are all, all things that, that you can do um, through the website. So I'm gonna show you here today. Um, I don't think I'm gonna have time in my 15 minutes to really go through <laughs> examples of all these, but hopefully in the, the workshop later, we can, we can look at some of that stuff. So kind of for the, the average user, um, people probably are gonna wanna access data through the web. Um, so basically going to a website, finding a station and downloading something or just looking at the data on their screen. Uh, so at PCAC, we offer the, the station data portal. Um, it contains all of that data that we put together under the climate related monitoring program. Um, those stations that are still operating get updated. Many of them get updated in near real time. So on a hourly in some cases and daily in other cases basis. Um, and then with you know, monthly and uh, coarser scale assurances that we're, we're gathering all the data. Um, so by accessing this URL, um, that doesn't directly take you to the portal. You have to click through some terms of use. Um, pages to get to it, but eventually you'll get to this portal that will show you how to filter through data um, and hopefully find the observations that you need for your area. It allows you to zoom in and select by, you know, variable temperature precip um, and really drill down and get you what you need. Uh, another way to access data, um, and I forgot to mention this in a second ago, but Environment and Climate Change Canada does participate in the, the CRIMP agreement. Um, in the first phase, they were, they were you know, on as supporters. Uh, now they're actual signatories of the agreement, uh, indicating a kind of a more wholehearted um, effort to help out with, with doing this in BC and, and eventually all over Canada is, is their goal. Um, and the reason I bring that up is um, we hold Environment Canada data in our, our trove, um, but you can also go directly to them and, and get their data. Um, so if you go down to, you know, a weather forecasting page and scroll down to the bottom, you'll find a link for historical data and it will directly take you to a web page where you can download a, a CSV of a data file. Um, that contains the most recent observation. So in addition to that, um, there's, there's access to process data. So this is, these are observations that have been processed into something um, that may be more directly applicable than just a raw temperature measurement or a raw precipitation measurement. Uh, and I think one of the, one of the key players here, um, uh, to my mind anyway, is, is the Farm West site that Stephanie Tam's group runs. Um, it's important because there's direct access to calculators for calculating metrics that are that are important for growers, including some pest related metrics. Um, 
I imagine most people here are more familiar with this site than I am, but um, I think it's an important resource. Uh, another thing we do at, at PKIC is we take the data and construct monthly weather anomalies. Um, so we have this little tool that allows you to pick a month and a year um, and a variable and have a look at where in the province that variable has been measured over the month and how that past month has compared to long-term climatology. So in this case, we're looking at um, January of this year, um, the, the before times, before the pandemic. Um, and you see what's mapped is the precipitation anomaly and, and all those green and uh, light green colors show that January was a very wet year. So um, I could envision that kind of processing help people to understand um, what they're seeing on the ground. Uh, I also generate uh, these kind of more static maps. Um, we make these available on our website. Uh, so in this case, I'm showing uh, earlier this summer, or I guess the end of spring, but um, so this is the, the map for May of 2020, um, showing that it was quite wet in southeastern BC and quite dry up in the north. And then I break these down into more regional maps that show on a kind of a watershed scale uh, what the anomalies look like. And then we also look at things in terms of long-term trends. So here's a map of long-term temperature trends for BC. Um, those are available from the Ministry of Environment's website. And yeah, this, this presentation is being recorded and will be available. So don't worry about trying to write down all these links. Um, Environment Canada maintains a similar um, tool. Uh, this is actually a tool that they're putting a fair bit of work into, it appears, because it keeps changing and, and growing with what it contains. Um, but it allows you on a, on a very detailed scale to look at um, temperature, rainfall, um, snowfall, wind, uh, various anomalies or values all across Canada. Um, both on a daily and a weekly and a monthly basis. Um, so this is, is turning into a really, a really cool product that Environment Canada is maintaining. And then finally, um, here at PKIC, we, we also create these long-term climate maps. So the, the long-term averages on a monthly basis of temperature and, and precipitation across the province. Um, and those kind of give you the framework of the climate that you're operating in. And these are at a very high spatial resolution of, of 800 meters. Um, so they're, they're able to really get down, you know, pretty close to the farm scale um, and at the farm scale for, for larger um, growing regions or larger farms. Uh, and then finally, it's, of course, you can access data through uh, you know, computer programming. Uh, this is the kind of power user approach. Uh, we make some resources available online um, through our a couple of software troves, uh, one at our website, one on GitHub. Um, use those with caution. Um, they're, the one on GitHub especially is, is it's kind of our, our production environment. So there's not gonna be a, an easy to follow um, set of steps to get to, to downloading the data that way, but I'll, I'll sh give you a hint at how to do that in other ways. So for our, our station data portal, we have a web-based API for accessing um, the stations. And essentially it's, it's a matter of finding um, basically the, the internal identifier for the station you're interested in uh, which is on our data portal by viewing the metadata. And then entering in a URL with the name of the network and the station identifier. So in this case, uh, that link at the bottom says, you know, Flynn Row WMB, so wildfire management. And then the slash 1002, that 1002 is their internal identifier. And if you enter that URL, you'll get the data that is associated with that station spit out. And so it's possible to write a program that uh, slices and dices the 
station lists that we provide through our metadata uh, to grab as much or as little data as you want. And you can filter by variable and temperature over a certain threshold and, and things like that. Uh, Environment Canada has a similar way of doing this. Um, I'm just going to skip over it for now, but there's uh, actually a couple ways to programmatically get at their station data. And then kind of the granddaddy of them all, the potentially most um, confusing is something they call data mart. Um, essentially, I mean, the weather forecasting agency is, is incredibly data intensive and uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada makes almost all of that data available online um, on that website, dd.weather.gc.ca. So if, if you go there, you'll see this very boring web page. It's just a list of um, folders. <laughs> it kind of looks like your, um, your file browser on your laptop or your computer. And you can drill down and find everything from station data to air quality data to radar to you know weather model data. Uh, basically, everything that describes the atmosphere over Can Canada over the last month is maintained, and they just keep this kind of rolling month-long window of data uh, available for users. So if if you want to start building up your own archive of the observations, you can go to Data Mart um, and download that data. And one of the initiatives that CRIMP is working on, the Climate Related Monitoring Program, is getting the BC um, Ministry's data up on Data Mart. And as of now, there are three, three ministries that have data up there. So just a very brief set of recommendations. I think I'm about out of time here. I probably went over, I'm sorry. Um, so just very crudely, if you want you know, web accessible recent weather data, um, I think PCIX station data portal or ECCC's pages, um, not data mart necessarily, um, are the probably the easiest, most user-friendly way to get that. Uh, if you want process metrics um, for some dis decision support kind of applications, um, FarmWest is pretty easy to use. Uh, if you want summaries of recent weather anomalies, um, that uh, weather anomaly map page that I showed from ECCC is, is a great one. And then if you want to roll up your sleeves and get you know, large amounts of data or specific data for specific locations, um, you know, both PKIC and ECCC maintain these uh, kind of power user websites to help you, help you get that data. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there and um, I don't know if we're gonna roll into the next slide and, but I'll uh, let Samantha step in and, and pick it from here. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Farron, for that. That was a really good overview with the small amount of time we asked you to stick to. Um, we are going to move pretty quickly into the next presentation. Um, as described at the beginning, this is really meant to be more of a, a workshop than a typical series of presentations. So we don't unfortunately have time for Q&A, but um, uh, we will make sure those slides get shared for people who want to follow up on some of those uh, sources. Um, so before we jump into the next presentation, Shauna is just going to share the results of that quick poll we did so you can get a sense of who's in the room. I'll pass that to you, Shauna, to share the results of the poll. Oh, she shared them already. That uh, as a host, I didn't see that. So you hopefully saw who else is in the room. And I see people have been introducing themselves uh, in the chat box. So feel free to continue introducing yourself in the chat box to everyone if you uh, joined a little bit before those initial, um, that initial invitation. Okay, so um, our next presentation is Hannah Whitman a professor at the Faculty of Land and Food Systems 
and Institute for Resource Environment and Sustainability and an academic director for the Center of Sustainable Food Systems. Hannah will be presenting today on Dataverse and Light Farm, data sharing, tools for, data sharing tools for BC farmers and researchers. So Hannah, please begin sharing your screen and... Uh, So we can't hear you, Hannah. Uh, it says you're still muted. Oh, there, I see I it coming think I got it. The presentation looks great. <laughs> it's slightly strange. Okay, so I'm very happy to be here today on the unceded territory of the Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations peoples. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm presenting on behalf of a large group of team members at UBC particularly Molly McDowell, who was the researcher responsible for developing uh, UBC Farms data governance and open access data plan over the last couple of years <clears throat> as part of our diversified agroecosystem research cluster. And I also want to acknowledge Zia Marabi and Kevin Kusin, who really have been the breath behind the evolution of Light Farm over the last few years, and then also Michael Pinkard, who's our current graduate student working on our UBC Farm Dataverse. So I'm kind of presenting this on behalf of our team and really looking forward to hearing from folks what questions that you have. So, so just as a bit of background, um, the UBC Center for Sustainable Food Systems brings together researchers who work on agricultural problems, including pest management all over the world, not just in British Columbia, but across Canada and then in, in various regional locations. And what we find is that even though these places are really different, they all face a lot of the co same common problems. So trying to increase food production, trying to reduce biodiversity loss, trying to address greenhouse gas emissions, water problems, food security. And so we really find that the data that we have available to research these problems is highly variable. There's, there's ecosystems, you know, as, as, as Farron just showed, that have a lot of available data and there's other ecosystems that we just have really sparse data on what's, what's happening. And so a couple of years ago, we really started looking into how we can improve uh, the scientific understanding of the diversity of context specific agricultural management um, practices and outcomes and how we can sort of fill some of those data gaps with um, new kinds of data sharing and, and data and share open access data collection tools. So what is an open data framework? So um, the Center for Sustainable Food Systems um, with this sort of initiative to try to fill the gaps in, in agricultural and land use data towards sustainability. Uh, open data is data that anyone can access, use, and share. That means making data accessible online, putting it in standard digital forms, which are machine readable, and having terms or licenses that allow anyone to reuse the data for anything. So that's the, the most pure definition of open data. So why, why would we promote this? Um, as I mentioned, to unlock the power of data-driven solutions for agriculture, to better understand the diversity of challenges faced by farmers, to design and disseminate context-adapted solutions, to make it easier for farmers to access data related to weather and, and various other things. So one of the issues that we found is there's increasingly data available to farmers in this kind of open data model and to researchers but it's not all packaged and easy to use and interoperable. So what are some concerns that have been raised as we've discussed this procedure with farmers? Um, a lot of farmers are really concerned about data sovereignty. If we're talking about their own data from their own farm, so not you know weather station data that's accessible to everybody, but data about specific management practices or data about specific sales records or data about specific existence of an endangered species on a farm. There is concern about 
who has access to that data and what are they going to use it for? Uh, farmers are concerned and researchers with privacy and, and concerns about the implications of potentially identifying individuals within open data sets. Researchers and kind of tool developers are interested in interoperability. Can data be accessed and utilized via multiple platforms? And then I would love to hear in the breakout other concerns that people have when they hear that the concept of open data. So UBC Farm is now using uh, what is called a Dataverse portal, which is an academic open access academic data repository. And this is hosted, um, it came out of um, a multi-university collaboration, first hosted by Harvard and then also now hosted by University of Toronto, where um, scholars from, from all over can collate, curate, and make accessible data from their research. So in terms of the UBC farm, we're now posting all of our research and operations data there, and we can kind of keep track and have version control across data sets. And we can include what we call complete metadata for each data set. And I'm actually gonna walk you through that. So this is the scholars, I have to go transfer over to the internet here. Um, I want to stop share and then I want to reshare. Okay. So what is metadata? I actually think I need to, sh sorry, I'm, I'm have a new screen and it's causing me a lot of zoom problems. I would like to stop share again. And I would like to share my desktop one, there we go. Okay, so now you can see my PowerPoint and my other thing. So, okay, so here's here's the, the scholars portal dataverse. Can you see that? And, and the link will be in the slide. So this is just an example of some data sets from UBC Farm that we're now starting to put online and anybody can go in there and explore them. So, you know, we have data set on the prevalence and existence of fungal pathogens on seed and transport plant records, farm-based field maps, our long-term biodiversity monitoring program, and so on. And so this is kind of expressing our, our role as a public institution where we're developing and spending public resources to conduct research. We wanna make sure that the results of that research are, are, are publicly accessible. So back to the presentation, maybe. So metadata is the clear identification of who collected the data, where, and on what dates. And we use sustainable or standardized variable names and formats to be used within the data sets. So for example, dates should look a particular way in all the data sets. Crops should have standard, standardized names and all researchers must refer to our fields using the same codes. So our data manager at the CSFS will work with researchers, students, and others um, coming to the farm to help curate and clean their data such that when it's posted on the UBC Farm Dataverse, it's comparable with data from other projects. So our Dataverse licensing agreement, I wanna talk a little bit about licenses. Um, it ensures that those who download and use our data share our priorities. And so many of you have probably heard of something called a Creative Commons license. And the most, I'm gonna actually show you um, the difference in some of these licenses. Creative Commons licenses um, give everyone from individual creators to large institutions a standardized way to grant public permission to use our work. And so the most open one um, allows re users to redistribute, remix, adapt, and build upon the material in any way, including for commercial use. So for example, if a researcher decides um, to put their data on Dataverse, but they're open to that data being um, used for commercial use, then they can give it this kind of license. And then the most restrictive Creative Commons license would say that only, only non-commercial 
use is allowed for this data. And so we work with researchers to figure out what is the best way to make their data accessible, but to ensure that that data is used in ways that are permissible. So there are different versions to specify when and how data can be used for commercialization. And then any new results or data sets that emerge from the use of that data should be shared under the same licensing agreement. So at UBC, we have researchers that have chosen to use other licensing options that are not Creative Commons, which is fine too. Some um, um, proprietary research uses a custom terms of use, um, and then some research can use a standard copyright. So we, how do we protect our privacy? Um, we do anonymize data that's posted. So this would be, for example, um, we wouldn't include any personal information on uh, things that we're posting on Dataverse. So if it's a collection of farm surveys, we wouldn't put necessarily, we put, wouldn't put the name of the farmer. Or we wouldn't put the address. We wouldn't put any contact information. Um, if the data set is small and posting data about a particular farm would easily enable someone to identify that location of that farm, that data would be suppressed. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the process of posting open data to ensure that we're A, following the metadata um, designs, B, protecting participant privacy, and C, ensuring that data is gonna be used in the way that it was originally intended. And so um, we also, like to know who was using the data. So even this morning when I was downloading some data to show you, I was asked by UBC Farm to identify myself and to say, why did I wanna use this data? So we're also get, starting to collect better, a better sense of who, who's accessing open data in relation to our work. And you know, this is a way to develop future partnerships and projects. So UBC Farm researchers working at UBC Farm are required to share their data with us within six months of completion. Um, we work with our researchers to post the data as soon as possible after their publications come out. Um, uh, what we hope at a, at a maximum of three years after completion. When I came into this role five years ago, that UBC Farm didn't have any of the data that had been collected for the last 30 years. So lots of research was done at UBC Farm and then that, re that data remained on hard drives and drawers and in student theses and kind of scattered around. So one of the things that we've done in the last um, three or four years is start to kind of resurrect previous data that was collected, put it into this data uh, format and then start to build a historical record. And so what we're encouraging, you know, our broad network of researchers to do is to ensure that all of that work that has been conducted in the past isn't lost, that it's archived properly and can be used to identify tre trends over time on a variety of topics related to, to sustainable agriculture. I do wanna note that indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge data um, that is collected or, or, or used at the farm is exempt from our um, standard data sharing policy. And, and we're working closely with the um, Indigenous Research Support Initiative at UBC to be able to support Indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge projects to curate data in ways that make sense for them. So um, it's it, the open data concept, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum from one size fits all to um, really curating data interoperability in ways that are respectful and in different contexts. Um, so here's just an example of a data synthesis from open data. Um, for example, this is a, a, a speaking to the topic of today's today's session. So um, Deborah Lechono did a did a study a few years ago where she collected data from 45 different studies that had been uh, published over the last 10 years to see if plant diversification schemes reduced herbivores and or increased the natural enemies of herbivores. And so she was able to, to take that open data produced by others, synthesize it, and come up with some really interesting results. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, sorry. I don't have COVID, I've just been talking a lot. Um, yeah, so this is just to speak to the, you know, why are we doing this? It's, it's basically the power of numbers. If we can collect more data from more places 
and have that data be more context specific as researchers and as extension people in extension or advocacy roles, we can offer better um, evidence informed solutions to agricultural problems. So I'll just walk you through an example from EBC farm data just super quickly so you can see how it works and then everyone is welcome to go and play around. So if I click on um, the, the Dataverse portal and I go to the integrated pest management records. Um, so here we are on the portal. I'll scroll down to get to the um, pest management records, which is here. And then here you can see the data, the, the metadata. So it says, what do we add? It describes what's in here. It describes um, what are the, the variables that are uh, present in the observation records and the spray records. And then what are the, what, what, how are those defined? And then I could download the file if I wanted, or I can sort of, so here we have um, IPM records again, observation records, action records, and I can either download them or I can sort of explore the data right here. So it's asking me again, why do I want to look at this? Um, let's see, please UBC farm accept me. Um, I think it's because I already had it open. So then, and then you can sort of click around and see what's happening in different places on the farm. Well, it was working before, but. Hi, Hannah, this is Samantha, just stepping in to let you know you've got to about five minutes left. Okay, well, that's it. So basically, this is an example of what's happening at the Dataverse. Um, we are really interested in hearing from participants about how this may be useful. Um, you know, right now we're building up long-term historical records for the UBC farm as a long-term socio-ecological experiment station. And so we're piloting a number of methodologies to make it easier to collect long-term monitoring data on a whole range of things that we're interested in, like climate, water, biodiversity, food security, yield, labor, all those things. So one of the, um, let's get up here. So one of the results of this exploration of, you know, first of all, the effort that it took to find all the previous data related to UBC Farm, which is collected by many other people, and then the effort it's taking to, to curate specific data sets from different researchers, and also hearing from diversified farmers that they wanted a way to, um, to be able to have access to that data for themselves, because that's actually one of the other big problems is that, that researchers come to farms, including the UBC farm, and it's a long time before that data gets back to farmers. And so our team, and in this case, uh, definitely led big time by Zia Marabi, who is a research associate at UBC, um, in this process of trying to figure out how to better collect data at UBC Farm, we ended up coming up with a new and open access uh, farm management tool designed to help farmers with understanding better their cost of production and their sustainability outcome reporting. So I'm just gonna walk you through this super quickly with the idea that um, we're putting a tool in the hands of farmers to collect data that matters to them. And then with their consent, um, this, uh, this data can be accessible to researchers. And so we're working with farmer groups in seven countries right now to pilot this app. We're just um, on a soft launch and we'll be doing the global big splash in, in January. So it's definitely available for any of you to, to try out and give us feedback right now. The idea is that farms can, um, they can map their fields, they can um, log practices that's happening on those fields. They can register different kinds of soil analyses. They can put in water monitoring uh, sensors to, not, to document the water balance. It pulls in climate data from open access portals, the, such as those that were described in the last presentation. Farmers can um, document their scouting and their um, pest management practices. And then there's modules to um, track uh, things like labor and input costs and sales records. And so the idea is that this is this idea of open data, it's using the power of, of algorithmic data that's available in the open sphere, plus 
proprietary data that belongs to specific farmers that they're 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 keeping for themselves and producing insights uh, that the farmer can use in real time. We we'll even have one on labor happiness. So the idea with Life Farm then is to is to take um, oops is to like I said put the put the power of open data into the hands of farmers to really be careful with issues of data sovereignty in the sense of um, protecting farmers' privacy with the analysis of that data. So farms can actually put different roles for access, researcher access, the farm owner access, extension officer access. So our partners in Latin America, for example, um, who don't have a lot of connectivity on their farms, they're, they're enabling their extension workers to mainly be the ones to input and, and and, and track data from their farms using Light Farm. So farmers retain ownership to the data, they can recuse, they can kind of kick the researchers off at any time. And then we have a very in-depth data policy that's described in the consent form to Light Farm. So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, that's kind of the big picture of how we are trying to track what's going on in a really complex landscape like the UBC farm and then how we're trying to take that learning of, of data integration and um, data informed management into the hands of farmers globally. So thank you for the time.